Day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the very first Talking Up Africa brought to you by Africa Scotland Business Network. Apologies for the, the technical issues that we've had even one and a half years after us learning how to do virtual events. We still have our uh, technical issues to deal with, so apologies for that. For those who are joining an ASBN platform for the first time, I'm Claire and not Nicola Proven, the co-founder of ASBN, as my camera suggests. I'm one of the three directors here at the network. Please feel free to engage with myself or our team at ASBN anytime. Please let us know where you're tuning from, tuning in from in the chat function, what company you represent, and we'll certainly be opening up the floor for questions once all our speakers have presented today. So Talking Up Africa very quickly is a brand new Africa focused business information series. It brings the top industry experts from both Africa and overseas markets to the fore to discuss business topics trending on the African continent. The objective is, of course, to share knowledge and solutions and to use Talking Up Africa as a way to connect with leading industry speakers and, of course, other members of the audience. Today's launch episode focuses on the rather sensitive and distressing yet highly critical issue of the Ukraine-Russian war and its impact on African markets. We're delighted to welcome ASBM members to the very first episode. We have Tara O'Connor, who will be joining us shortly. She's the CEO of Africa Risk Consulting. Daniel Kivishi, Sub-Saharan Market Economist at Rand Merchant Bank. Patrick O'Driscoll, fellow Global Scott and CEO of Agile Power Solutions, tuning in from Dubai this afternoon. Hi, Andrew Pike. Head of Ports, Shipping and Logistics at Bowman's Law Firm. The session today Hi, is moderated by Stephanie McDonald. She's an international commercial lawyer focusing on UK African markets. She's also the, the non-exec director of Africa Scotland Business Network. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Stephanie to kickstart the very first Talking Up Africa. Thanks, Claire. Great introduction and, and welcome to, to everybody. So today's broad question is, what impact is the war in Ukraine having on Africa, on African markets, on African governments, on African trade, on African communities, and ultimately on African people? And we're going to tackle this topic from four angles. We're going to look at the broad geopolitical impact on Africa and how governments are responding to that. Secondly, we're going to look at it from uh, the point of view of economics and financial and other markets. Third, we're going to look at it from the point of view of supply chain. What impact is the war having on getting goods in and out of uh, the African region. And finally, we're going to look at it from the point of view of energy, a very hot topic around the world at the moment and, uh, and also here in, in Africa. I think that Tara, unfortunately, is having some problems connecting. So we're going to start with Daniel, who's here uh, in the room with me today. And I'd like to ask Daniel to, to give us uh, a broad overview review of the impact that the war is having uh, here in Africa, obviously, particularly given your skill set from the economic and markets perspective, but your broader views are, are also welcome, uh, Daniel. Thank you so much. Uh, and to all our guests, uh, welcome. I, I hope this conversation will be as engaging for you as it has been for me from the beginning of this year, chatting around the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war on all uh, economies on the continent. So. A few things that are important before we really dissect this is timing. Timing is probably what's quite key for everyone to understand the impact that Russia Ukraine spilled over to most of the African markets happened at a time when 
Growth was still in a period of recovery coming out of a pandemic, which is very important for people that they tend to forget this. Secondly, a lot of our governments were in a period that we're dealing with a lot of sizable external debt and local debt that they had picked up during the pandemic and they were trying to consolidate all of that. Thirdly, though it was an environment where there was talk at the time of getting into higher interest rates across our various markets. And lastly, key point was that a lot of our businesses were dealing with high input, co input costs already given the challenges that the pandemic had brewed. So we got to about February of this year and it became quite clear that there was going to be some challenges, to put it quite lightly, that was going to be spilling over to various economies. The first one that we noticed that was quite direct was, of course, the impact in the oil market. So oil prices shot up. We had a period in time where they sort of peaked at about 130, if not a tad bit higher. And this immediately meant that a lot of our governments on the continent got into this process of adjusting the retail prices commensurate with how it is the experienced oil prices. Increase. And this meant extremely sharp increases across our pump prices. And they took place over a period of time and we've faced an environment where you know, at the pump price people were complaining that the one a little bit closer to home we saw both maize and wheat prices increase and the concern here really stemmed from not only how much Russia and Ukraine were supplying to global markets, but the impact that it was just having on pricing of these commodities. Now, closer to home again, by closer to home, I mean in the Southern African markets where we can actually track soft commodities via suffix. Same escalation that was taking place internationally, we could see it on our prices here. And that meant we started dealing with higher food prices. And this was quite a challenge if you consider that the core of the inflation that people are dealing with, and by core, I don't necessarily mean from an economic point of view, but the stuff that people are spending on, on a regular basis across the continent, is somewhat mirrored between a combination of how much they're spending on food and how much they're spending on transport. In the midst of a period that's recovering, it's a key challenge for various consumers and, gov and government agencies to try and balance this. So this is a theme that has then permeated until today. And it has had added on to some of the other restrictions and pressures that we've already seen on the supply chain disruption perspective brought about by the pandemic that we'll be chatting a little bit more around. But one that people tend to forget is that in the middle of all of this geopolitical tension, we also had a China that was slowing down. Right? So China had opted to take a zero COVID policy. They're still utilizing this and we'll be chatting around this as well later in the call. But it's very key for the people on this call to recognize with a view that China was going to be slowing down, we saw other commodity prices starting to tank. So our African markets were now dealing in an environment where oil is up, food is up, and you're not going to be getting the same export type of earnings that you expected because some of your commodity prices have come down. And then there was the issue in the financial markets. So we entered a risk-off environment and we saw significant capital outflows from the continent. And this immediately played out with respect to the various FX views. Right? So we saw this depreciatory trend across most of our currencies. If you think of the big ones, the Ghana SETI has already done 60% to date. We saw the Kenya shilling also decline by quite a large margin of 149, about 125. The Naira went through a lot of pressure. South Africa was a bit of a different case. First half of the year, they had a stronger rand relative to other emerging market venture. Effectively, they were also impacted. So now you've got this confluence of issues impacting us both on the financial side. We're seeing that from an FX perspective, but then also from an economic perspective as well. The real sectors of the economy started to struggle. And that's pretty much broad strokes, just how impactful the Russia-Ukraine was being on the continent, especially given the time that we were still in the country. Yeah. So, Daniel, can you give us some specific examples of countries here in Africa that are 
particularly struggling from these factors, as well as perhaps some countries who are, are finding solutions to this quicker than others. So we, we have to contextualize it. So there were those who struggled immediately and then they have sort of got onto a much softer landing and then there are those who are still struggling now. It's also a very key, key, key issue to debate. So at the beginning, the onset of the war, I think the immediate markets were Egypt. Everyone remembered what was going on. Inflation immediately spiked up in, in Egypt. They had to go into a period of starting to hike up interest rates. They were extremely concerned of not being able to get their products into the country at a fair price. But another country that immediately also saw a lot of this impacts was places like Kenya. Even though we've been translating immediately into the numbers, inflationary pressures started to build. Mm -hmm. And then this sort of seeped out into other markets across the country, uh, across the continent, forgive me. So we saw a lot of that then impacting environments, or not rather the Southern African markets like South Africa, Namibia, Mozambique. Um, they were impacted by this as well, but it was just happened in stages. You know, right now where we sit, we're, we're dealing with an environment where while inflation is still quite elevated, a lot of these governments have done quite a lot to try and support the local consumers from a pricing perspective, but they've also actually gone to international markets to see if they can get funding for additional subsidies or to maintain some of those debt obligations that they had given this very difficult time. Again, Egypt comes to mind. Egypt had to negotiate quite extensively with its bilateral partners for additional support, really at a time when it was facing severe pressures. And you know, this, this meant that they could then get grants or additional funding from places like the UAE, which then offered some form of fiscal buffers. The other countries, the challenge was they had to sort of try and just ride it out, right? They didn't really have a lot of fiscal room. They had already faced a lot of challenges during the pandemic from a fiscal point of view. And so their option and alternative was really to just pay for a higher import bill and really hope for the best that we would get into the final quarter of this year or early next year. And a lot of these issues would have dissipated. And that's where a lot of countries are sitting now. Much higher import bills that they're still paying for, much higher on the food prices and trying to maintain some sort of fiscal prudence an environment. Yeah. yeah, and do you see any evidence of stabilization on some of these, these areas now? Is there any positive outlook for later this year or next year? We'll spend more time maybe you know hearing some of the experts around commodities and, and how they see it. We, we have noted oil prices have come down and international maize and prices have come down, which is a positive. Mm -hmm. But the bigger positive for the region is the fact that we've had decent rain. And the view is entry next year, food inflation will not be as big of a problem as it was. China's interesting story, though. If China does continue with its sort of start and stop policy around how it's restricted some of its cities, you could continuously see oil prices also come down, which then helps to stabilize fuel inflation, which will also be a big positive. So that's how we're reading it for the rest of the year and early next year. That's pretty much the iterations that we expect will happen. What we know for certain though, is just given the higher input prices that businesses have had to face and, and the pressures consumers have seen, a lot of that has unfortunately eroded growth. Mm -hmm. And economic activity has slowed in various markets. It will, it will still be positive because it's Africa and for base effects and all these beautiful things and we still have agriculture and mining sector across most of our economies doing well. But the real sector of the economy and the bulk of where you would naturally see a lot of spend from businesses and from individuals, that has waned. And it will take a while before it bounces back, just given all these issues they're faced in such a short period of time. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. That's an excellent overview of where we're sitting now from an economic point of view in the African region. And I'm pleased to see that Tara has managed to overcome her technical difficulties. Uh, welcome, Tara, if you can uh, take your mute button off. We're ready, we're ready for you now. Um, great. So, so Daniel has given us a, a great introduction to, to the topic and has already delved into to detail on some of these key areas. Uh, I wonder if you might then talk to us about um, the broad global and African geopolitical situation at the moment and, and share some, some views on, on what's happening and, and what it means for, for this region. Super. And my apologies, it seems that technical glitches uh, 
um, I, I was permanently locked out of Zoom and had to re-register as a new user, which is quite, uh, which is quite uh, a, something for people in future, proper preparation and planning. Don't forget <laughs> that Zoom it also upgrades every so often. You have to remember that. Anyway, um, it's great to be talking to you and particularly on this subject. Um, and I think probably what I'd like to talk about is pro is three things, three essential things that give framework to uh, to what's going on in the continent and how Russia impacts uh, on the continent. And that, uh, you know, I'll start with the diplomacy side of things uh, that, you know, whether this is actually a return to Cold War politics or just the dying embers actually of the USSR. So, I mean, 40 years is not a long time in politics as one, as you get older, you realize it's it's really uh, just a grain of sand. Um, and so I think that's an important thing. The economic impact, I caught the end, uh, the end there of, uh, of what was being discussed and it seems to have been dealt with extremely well, but I'll just talk about some of the winners and losers. Obviously the social impact um, and then the, you know, the business impact that the things that people that might be on this call might need to be thinking about in terms of, of where to go, where to go next. But actually about this, you know, turning to the diplomacy uh, uh, side of things, we have seen uh, uh, with this, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who's actually the former um, head of, former head of Russian uh, Russia Ukrainian relations at NATO. And she was telling me that actually Russia has been at war with the traditional West as we see it since about 2014. And how did that manifest itself? Wherever there was a Western vacuum, Russia filled it. So if you look at Syria, Libya, um, and any of the countries where the West, traditional West had a difficult relationship with, Russia moved in to fill in. We've seen Russian activity in, in information wars across the continent and across the world, in fact, particularly with RT, the Russian state uh, television uh, station sponsor, and the financing of extreme right wing parties across the EU and the US, notably Marine Le Pen in France, the Italian right. Uh, and the quest, the you know, the jury is out about what sort of involvement uh, Russia had uh, in the Trump presidential campaign. Um, and so, but actually, you know, while all of that's been going on, lots of people have been shouting about it and saying, why aren't you taking more notice of what Russia is doing? But the real uh, wake up call came when eventually Russia went from its information, financing, disruptive strategic war to actually the military offensive. But in my opinion, and we can talk about this later, Vladimir Putin has massively miscalculated, um, and, but timing is everything. China's role will also be critical in the outcome of this. But in terms of diplomacy, where have we seen Russian outreach and what does it look like? You know, Russian outreach is actually through a, through again, my enemy's enemy is my friend. So wherever, you know, Western diplomacy falls down, you will find Russia moving in. Uh, so, and usually it's through the Wagner Group and private military company directly linked to Vladimir Putin and also making uh, outreach to former USSR countries, you know, so Mali is obviously high on its list. It was a very central country to, to the USSR. It was never lost links with Russia. And then you see, you know, the oligarch, you know, one of the things that Russia's outreach is about is training other countries to have the kind of corrupt oligarchy, kleptocracy type uh, structures. And you see that in totally manifest in Zimbabwe. Uh, and we've just seen, you know, the fourth Russia Zimbabwe Intergovernmental Commission just having taken place in June. What does that mean for Africa? You know, world leaders can are uh, again, you know, Africa has got a fabulous, another fantastic opportunity here uh, to actually play international governments against each other. 
So we just really saw, we, you know, we saw Sergei Lavrov conducting a four country tour of Ethiopia, Egypt, Uganda and Congo, uh, and almost followed immediately by the Secretary of State, the US Secretary of State uh, following in his trail. Fabulous opportunity for, uh, for uh, you know, for leverage, um, for leverage in terms of diplomacy. But also one of the things that you, we, we noticed that from, you know, Russia, Russia is a big supplier of arms to, to Africa. And we, we, you know, really now with the way that things are going in the war in Ukraine, that is a pretty bad advert for Russian, Russian arms manufacturers, I would suggest. Economic impact, we've just talked about. Obviously, the scarcity in fuel is a is a really big problem. Wheat prices have re risen 60 percent. You know, the two big wheat importers are obviously Egypt with 100 million population, Nigeria with 200 million population. And obviously that uh, increases prices, stability, pressure on governments to subsidize both fuel and uh, and and wheat imports. Um, and obviously, then production of agricultural production is hit also by uh, by the you know the downturn in availability of products such as fertilizers and so on. But on the other side, you've 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 got the boom time for oil producers. You know, Angola, Nigeria, South Sudan, Congo, Gabon, all producers of oil that actually have. You know, Angola in particular, it puts it at the time of elections in a particularly good position because previous prior to that, Angola's debt was about 115 percent of GDP. And this gives it some relief. Uh, but other countries such as Zambia, Ghana, Nigeria that are net. Well, you know, Nigeria has other problems, but are now increasingly being pushed into higher debt positions and the risk of debt default has obviously increased across the continent, not just due to the war, but, um, but also due to sort of the, the long overhang of, from the COVID crisis and the complete North-South supply disruption that that, uh, that that imposed on many, on many countries. And then the my final point, well, third, you know, third is obviously the social impact, the social, the cost of living crisis, which is manifesting itself. You know, we've had protests and riots around, uh, surprisingly, only in ten countries, but you know, you've seen it in South Africa. Um, you see, you see gr increasing levels of dis, you know, discontent and disruption in in southern South Africa, Southern Africa. Um, but protests, um, some linked to elections, but also just to the added pressures of, um, of the cost of living crisis. Got a massively important election coming up next year in Nigeria at the same time as you've got a totally uh, a crushing, uh, in crushing inflation rates, shortage of, uh, of, of wheat, shortage of food, food insecurity. All of that just adds to particular problems that are also already caused by the biggest crisis in the world, which, of course, is climate change. And you're seeing in East Africa a very, uh, you know, the dependence on on, ex, on, on imports of wheat um, and uh, being exacerbated by production being reduced by a very severe drought that, that is continuing. But also the implications are that you've got sort of with with these social impact pressures, you actually also then see a weak with Russia's involvement as well. You see a weakened commitment to the movement of democracy. Uh, so you're getting more uh, malleable uh, leaders that are potentially more malleable um, and that unrest and disruption moving into a uh, potential future conflict or the resumption of uh, of engineered conflicts such as proxy conflicts in Libya and Sudan for example and declining state one last thing declining state society relationships across the across the continent and then what the final point that i i am because we're very short on time 10 minutes the final point that i'd like to make is obviously 
the implications of sanctions that um, the, the most important tool, I mean, here, this is probably the very first, um, the very first conflict that is um, uh, uh, the, the very first uh, um, uh, conflict that, well, I would say that sanctions being used as a, as a counter to conflict for the very first time. South Africa, we are very familiar with, uh, with sanctions against South Africa that was very effective in the anti-apartheid struggle. But actually here we have it used on a global scale as an alternative to actually invading or, or getting involved militarily as part of the military counteroffensive. And I, uh, I, if you hear children in the background, it is because there are many of them still at home. Uh, not back at school yet, apologies. Um, uh, thank you, Tara. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. It was a fascinating uh, set of views there uh, on, on how the war is impacting Africa in, yeah. in all different ways. And I'm glad that you, you actually finished on, on sanctions because yes. I know that that's something uh, that Andy, Andy Pike, who's, who's up next, um, yes. will be able to talk to you as well in yes. terms of the practical impact that that's having uh, on, yes. on trade here and getting goods in and out of the country. So, so Andy, uh, you know, you, you're the man who's uh, very close to the action. Oh, there we go. We lost you for a minute. <clears throat> very close to the action uh, when it comes to understanding what's happening in terms of shipping and logistics and supply chain challenges. Uh, getting goods into the African region, out of the African region, and I suppose also uh, understanding how intra-African trade uh, is now changing as a result of those challenges, perhaps not yet, but looking looking to, to the future. So do you want to give us a, a, a bit of a sense of what's going on at the moment on the ground, Andy? Yeah, sure, Stephanie. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to everybody. So. On the trading side, as um, Tara said, the sanctions have been really extensive. And I think it's the first time ever that you've had such um, a sort of cohesive package of mm -hmm. sanctions that it's been so broad uh, or widespread. And, but particularly, of course, driven by the US and, and Europe. And part of that has, resulted in, for instance, the uh, a, a huge part of the world fleet being excluded from trading to Russia. So, you know, if you accept that, that you know, the world fleet is made up largely of um, Europe, European ships, American ships, Chinese, and, you know, and then the rest, um, you've excluded probably two thirds of the availability of the world fleet to trade to and from Russia. And the net result is a constrained shipping capacity across the globe uh, for people who are still able to trade with Russia. So South Africa, for instance, have not imposed sanctions. They're able to trade freely with Russia, but to, to uh, and there are several African countries in the same, in the same position. But to get cargo, for instance, from South Africa to Russia, until a few weeks ago, the, well, until the war started, it was a, it was a direct transit of, say, three weeks, and, and the job was done. Then the war started. Many, many countries, exporters from Africa, had cargoes on the water. But suddenly, European carriers were saying we can't go to Russia, so we're going to just dump the stuff in Europe, and you guys need to make make a plan about it. But trust us, you're the shipper. You're going to be paying all of the storage costs for um, discharging this cargo and storing it and doing something with it in the meantime. So suddenly there was mayhem in markets which existed pre-war, pre-sanctions. People started working ways around it. One of the ways of doing it, though, was to continue working with the same shipping company, but to take the cargo to Europe, transship it at Bremerhaven, Rotterdam, somewhere like that, and then 
get a, a Chinese ship or an unsanctioned ship to come and pick it up there and take it to Russia. There was the added problem that every cargo going to Russia then had to be scanned in Europe to make sure there was no illicit um, cargo in a container, for instance, any arms that were going to Russia. And so suddenly a fruit exporter from South Africa who was originally taking three weeks to get his cargo to, to Russia was taking three months to get it to Russia. Apart from the issues of the cost of storing refrigerated cargo and, and whether it's even sustainable, that then creates you know, a, a potential three month hiatus in payments. Payment then becomes the next issue. As you know, um, Russian banks were excluded from the SWIFT payment settlement system. And so you've now had difficulties in confirming payments that were going through the Eurozone or, or dollar payment. And you know, either the, the, the confirmations were, were slow or they were, you simply couldn't trade in dollars or, or euros. And, and what is it? what do you do? Those are the primary currencies. You can't start trading in renminbi suddenly if there's no currency in your country, um, despite the fact that, that China have got their own sort of uh, swift equivalent called SIPs. But it takes time for this to happen. So you, and then the other thing with, with constrained shipping volumes, is that as with any system of supply and demand, the moment there's more demand for ships, the prices go up. So freight rates have rocketed and, um, and, and transit times have been delayed. And that, that has happened in both directions. So those, are, those are, are the sort of big ticket items. The situation was aggravated when, I think it was on the 10th of August, the EU issued a list of FAQs to do with sanctions and, and how they should be interpreted. And where everyone thought up until that moment that transshipment through Europe was fine, the FAQs now seem to say that you can't even do that. And, um, and they've basically taken all European involvement in trade in any way, shape or form off the table. Um, that presents a problem, for instance, where you've got joint ventures between European companies and African companies. So very often you do have these JVs and there will be imports perhaps directly from Russia, which you think is bypassing Europe and, and is, is free of the sanctions. But in fact, it's not because suddenly you've got a JV partner in the company or in the joint venture who is European, and that may then affect things. So people are now having to find structures to trade around that, that particular problem. Um, on the outward bound side, uh, we, we've heard, heard from both of you on you know, grain shipments and fertilizers and so on. Just noting that Russia and Belarus export something a huge number, it could be 70% of the world's fertilizers. And so you've got, you've got sanctions against those exports, but in terms of trying to get anything out of the sort of Black Sea Crimea area, Crimean area, you've got um, this embargo on ships. So you've got tens of millions of tons of, of wheat, which is in, you know, which just can't get out of the, the, the area and hundreds of ships which are tied up, you know, and at, at risk of being, being sunk, basically. So, you know, the, the, the supply chain is being squeezed at every level. And this, you know, there are no clever answers, save what you alluded to, Stephanie, and that is that, you know, there must be an opportunity. And in fact, people are going to have to start finding new markets. Those African countries which have imposed sanctions and simply cannot trade any longer with, um, with, with Russia will have to start finding new outlets. And you know, potentially there's, there's, there are huge opportunities here. 
certainly um, the logistics and the sort of cabotage opportunities along the African coastline exist, but it's going to take a while to ramp up, you know, an African fleet, for instance, to trade here. And but you you may find a complete reorder of the of the way logistics is done in Africa. And potentially I think it's quite exciting. I think it's a shakeup and I think it gives a lot of opportunity. But uh, as with anything, there's a lot of infrastructural cost and it's not going to happen overnight. So that's my sort of my sort of high level picture. Yeah, thanks, Andy. It's, it's fascinating to hear how things are, are playing out at the moment. And you mentioned, uh, to, you know, to what extent we are in Africa dependent on certain uh, goods coming from, from Russia or, or Ukraine. Can you just give our participants a bit of a insight into what sorts of goods typically Africa is sending to Russia? And to what extent that's impacting on uh, on on trade and, and on growth here? Yeah, so quite a bit of dry bulk things like manganese, chrome, uh, those sort of commodities. Um, we we certainly send a lot of fruit to Russia, and you know, the rush and I suppose the, the the benefit for those who haven't imposed sanctions is that. You know, the Russian will, Russia will have to have to source um, shortages from from those places, and many of them are in Africa. So, you know, there are some some potential benefits for those who who weren't minded to impose sanctions. Um, but yeah, so our, our sort of dry commodities are are, are quite a significant import uh, export for that part of the world, as well as. Um, as well as some of our, our agri agricultural products, um, yeah, that that sort of that's in sort of broad terms, and uh, and I think it is it is an opportunity for a realignment of those trading partners, but yeah. you know certainly from a South African point of view, our balance of trade is is in our favour as far as I know um, between us and Russia, and. Um, you know, it, I, I think that it's, you know, it could all go well. The, the one risk, of course, is that, as I think happened with the sanctions against um, Iran and, and Iraq, um, people who, who don't themselves impose sanctions, but who trade with with countries which are sanctioned by the US or sometimes pulled into the, those sanctions and sanctioned themselves. Now that hasn't happened yet, but I think that that's a real risk that could happen as a sort of next step if this if this thing doesn't resolve soon. Yeah. So thanks, thanks very much, Andy. And and if I can just pick up on something you said earlier about you know the potential for new markets, for new trading partners, and you know, hopefully a more positive outlook for, for Africa. I think that's a, a good link into our final topic today, which is energy. Um, and, and Patrick is going to, to give us some views on the energy situation here in Africa. Obviously, it's an extremely hot topic around the world at the moment, with many, uh, many countries globally uh, feeling the effects of energy insecurity and, uh, and and prices going through the roof. What's happening here in, in Africa on that front, Patrick? And um, do you see any opportunities now for, for Africa to become more self-sufficient from an energy point of view and perhaps to become a, a greater player in the provision of energy to those countries that are feeling the effects of the war at the moment on, on energy supply? Thanks and good afternoon, everybody. Yep, I am a huge supporter. I think this is Africa's time to stand tall and actually take control of its energy transition that is happening globally um, around the world. If I just touch on the, the last topic there that Andrew um, mentioned, investment has always been inward into Africa for its energy projects. Is that still going to be the case going forward? 
because there is such a huge demand being driven in Europe. And that investment is now, you can see com companies and organizations are migrating their focus into these safe havens, if you like, in Europe to drive LNG, gas to power and energy infrastructure. So is that taking investment away from Africa, from African energy projects? Yes, it, it, it is today. And that is, is that bad for Africa or is that a positive play for Africa? Africa can stand tall and be self-sufficient. In my belief, it just needs the structure and a process to actually drive itself forward. So investment hasn't been made into the power sector in the last three years. You've had COVID, we've had the war, and where is their new generation being actively built into the African network to become self-sufficient? People will then look and say, well, does this drive a time for renewables to take a firm place in the energy sector and we all live happily under the sun and the wind that uh, South Africa is blessed with. Um, renewables have, have a play and they have a purpose within the energy sector, but are they the be end all? No, they're not. They are part of the energy mix to provide energy security and they have to work hand in hand with the conventional fuels to be able to give each utility, each country, that dispatchable power as and when it's needed. Now, the sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day and the wind doesn't blow seven days a week, okay? So you do have to have the proper energy mix. Now, is that energy mix with the cost of fuel on where fuel is? Um, today, importing highly expensive fuel to run power generation. Ultimately, if it's not subsidized by government, it's the end user that's having to pay for it. And you can see that in the UK and in Europe on where the energy costs are climbing. Africa, utility purchase prices to the, by the consumer, they are expensive for Africa but they are heavily subsidized. And in the grand scheme of things, they are very affordable to elsewhere in the world because of the subsidy. Subsidies have to stop for investment to be driven into the utility sector and for utilities and for governments to have that standalone self-security of supply for their, for their countries. Now, the environmental race was touched upon do we continue to run um, fossil fuels? Does South Africa continue to run coal? Should it move to nuclear? Should it only be renewables? South Africa is a huge, it's the largest demand on, a, on the African continent today with a power supply, a bit not constant at this moment in time, but that's been through the lack of investment and this transitional change to drive renewables. So let's, let's look at managing this transition. The transition, everyone's imposed tight, tight timelines and tight deadlines. Are they realistically achievable post-COVID and with the war and the fuel pricing? There should be a longer term view on how to mitigate and manage this environmental race and this, this transition. That brings me on to another hot topic of LNG uh, and then the importing of LNG into uh, the energy sector uh, with where the LNG pricing is today. LNG was significantly more affordable and more acceptable than coal 36, 48 months ago from where it is today, okay? You have LNG today at being the most expensive fuel that's out there in the market. And you have people wanting to reduce the environmental emissions and get rid of coal. Can you afford 
to move and take that transitional switch through gas to replace replace this uh, environmental dirty fossil fuels are they that dirty at this time against the cost let's that's a debate for a lot of people to to get into i believe that there has to be a transition to a cleaner world and a cleaner fuel it's just how we get there and how we do it africa has huge reserves now of what has been proven in Mozambique. Tanzania has turned the corner and is looking to re reinvest and reinvite that international oil and gas play into developing its nat natural resources that it's got. South Africa has been doing some uh, looking at importing LNG to get through some of the, the issues that they've got with their security of supply. You have Equatorial Guinea, who I salute, they have a view that their LNG should be used for the benefit of the African continent and not be exploited and sold to the highest, the highest bidder, whether that be far, the Far East or Europe. They are a believer that they want to use their gas in the form of LNG and shipped around Africa to support and build Africa. And that you have to, I have to stand up and praise the Equatorial, Equatorians for, for actually taking that stance. It's how that actually happens in reality. And that's where the investment is needed in Africa for that supply chain from Equatorial Guinea to drive and support Angola. They sh are they going to take the same view? Is Elsewhere, Mozambique going to take the same view. Is Tanzania going to take the same view? And this is why I say now is the time for Africa to stand up. And we say we're talking Africa up. I wholeheartedly believe that this is Africa's time to actually make a change for itself and become self-sufficient. And you can't build economies and you can't strengthen the continent without a solid energy supply and energy security. And I think that is one of the most paramount things that uh, Africa have to look at uh, and get right in the coming uh, years. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, very interesting views there. And, you know, you, you mentioned uh, this question of, you know, do we use LNG for the benefit of Africa or to the highest bidder? And I, I know that very recently Mozambique announced their, their first LNG cargo export uh, to international markets. So maybe that's a signal, at least for Mozambique, that they're, um, they're open-minded about, about both options, I guess. Um, I just wanted to turn to, to Daniel, and I can see also there's a couple of questions for you, Patrick, that are coming through on the chat. I just want to turn to Daniel before we do that, because I know Daniel was mentioning to me earlier that uh, there are some other examples from elsewhere in Africa um, of good news stories or positive opportunities on the energy front? It's green hydrogen. I think that's probably the one that everyone's been talking about in terms of our ability as a continent to be able to export and sell that to the rest of the world. I, mean, I, I can almost imagine why Patrick didn't mention it. I know why, Patrick, because it's expensive. So I, I get it. <laughs> we do get it. In fact, we're still struggling in a lot of our countries to get the legislation right just around being able to sell the proceeds or rather the residue from both solar and wind, the synthetic fuels to the rest of the world. We've been talking about green hydrogen for several years, but we're really at a point where we need to get that pricing right. And the point that Patrick also made earlier, we need to think about structurally, who's gonna buy the stuff, right? And, and, and Patrick has brought up something very interesting. Does Africa have an inward look? And when, when, when he was speaking, I, I thought about this issue that the continent is facing. We're not one country. I don't think people understand how that's going to be problematic for us over the next couple of years, because that means whatever strategy that we use has to be synchronized in order for us to actually have a benefit with international markets. And, and, and I get it. We have to actually get to a place where at a bilateral or regional level, we make decisions even with respect to energy provisions to the rest of the world that makes sense, not only for one country, but for several countries as well, or rather regional blocks. And I think that's potentially where Africa could face a challenge. If you've got your neighbor willing to sell 
bulk of its energy externally to Europe, then the other guy next door is willing to look at inward, you know, an inward or local content strategy. And we've already seen that playing out with some of the other themes we spoke about. We saw that how it played out with broader challenges of input costs into the region. Some countries opened up their borders for additional products and some countries actually closed that. And, and it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to consider. And I guess maybe one could argue it's even a little bit more short term, mm. but it's a problem nonetheless. So, so yes, positive stories around you know, green hydrogen development on the continent. I, I love the idea of just transition and what that means. You know, I think a lot of African countries are well aware that they've had advocates both in India and China who could push back and say, look, we're not, not going to be able to transition immediately out of rural oil and gas. And the last COP really allowed more African countries to continue exploring some of these hydrocarbon uh, options. Mm. I think 10 years time, we may not necessarily have that much wiggle room. And we need to be honest around that. Uh, I see Tara's got a point there that maybe she wants to raise, but yeah, it's, it's absolutely true, right? So we need to think about the broader energy complex and maybe it's an oil yeah. and gas and hydrogen and solar yeah. that we yeah. connect. Tara, sorry, go for it. I totally agree. And I mean, looking at uh, energy, the energy mix, as you were saying, Patrick, is it also critical. But one of the countries that's been least negatively affected by this event is Kenya. Uh, you know, and Kenya is startling in its investment over the last 15 years in renewables. And what it's a little known fact about Kenya that 86% of its energy needs are provided by a mix of renewables. Uh, and so, and they've reduced their dependence on, on, on sort of fossil fuels to 15 to 20% depending. Um, and, uh, and that's and again, as you were saying, Patrick, it's a mix. You can't have one or one of the other. And Africa has got to make the most of it of where it's in best endowed, which is in gas, as you've mentioned, all the various gas deposits. Um, but uh, the role of renewables is critical, and the long term invest those who are long term investors in it have uh, have mitigated this risk considerably. Kenya being most notable. And Kenya has been fortunate of where it mm. sits in the continent mm. on, on, on basically having that geothermal. Geothermal, yes. Um, fault, mm. that, you know, it, it's got that mm. uniqueness, mm. Kenya. Mm. Um, South Africa, on the other hand, doesn't, ha doesn't have that uh, uniqueness of being on, a, on having that geothermal generation capability. But also the size of the two, you t the size of the two demands are totally um, different from each other. They're, they're polar opposites. And what South Africa is driving with a demand of 38, 40,000 megawatts versus, oh, is... versus Kenya, being able to manage that on mm. renewable energy. Now, geothermal in comparison to wind and solar and battery storage, yes, geothermal is much more manageable uh, and potentially dispatchable than uh, what some of those other renewable sources are. But just, just going back to one of the other points that, that I that I picked up on, and both myself and uh, James at uh, Agile, we've our belief is that the funding has to come from uh, a PPP um, partnership to achieve the African countries' need, but there has to be legal frameworks to yeah. ex existence to make it work, and that is something that has to be looked at. Don't put the you know don't put the horse before the cart and the cart before the horse. Let let's get the legal framework in place and make sure it exists to be able to get and drive that investment. And I do believe it will have to be through public private partnerships, partnerships. to make to make it work and to make it to be sustainable uh, going going forward. But I also, if I might just sorry, add. Mm. One more thing is that in a, in a, in a um, you know, when we're talking about Russia's, I mean, all corporates have to take account of, of geostrategic um, uh, things. And, you know, we've seen actually the, the Wagner groups, uh, uh, you know, Russia is a very big supplier to the world of gas um, and its geostrategic uh, play in the region is also about limiting others and preventing others from producing or controlling what production is 
produced. And a very good example of that is the Wagner Group's alleged failure to, uh, to, uh, to combat the Islamist or so-called Islamist insurgery, insurgency in Cabo Delgado, which had the immediate in fact, impact of obviously suspending a big project coming into development for probably five years. So, uh, so I think with our Russia analysis hat on, we do have to put that into the mix um, whenever we discuss what's next for gas, particularly. Yeah, yeah thanks, Sarah. And sticking with the, the energy topic, Patrick, you seem to be popular this afternoon. A uh, question actually from, from Andy, which I think is, uh, is relevant to some of the, the comments that have cropped up from, from all four speakers, is, you know, is it fair to say that from the point of view of logistics costs, those logistics costs being reduced if you're moving LNG among African countries, that that is a, a driver, a potential driver for intra-African energy trade. It is, it is, and it will it will significantly uh, reduce the, the time frames on having uh, large amounts of storage um, available, um, and for smaller African countries not being not being able to one afford and not have the demand to actually store one hundred and eighty thousand cbm of LNG that, that may last them 12 months rather than in some other instances that is being re that's being shipped to a country every six weeks. So yes, uh, it does certainly have uh, an impact an impact on it. Uh, the other option the other option is and do you trans do you move molecules or do you move electrons? And mm -hmm. as the power pools, and you start to then become and take a regional view, the South African power pool, the West African power pool that's now um, becoming more, more prominent, East African power pool. So as these power pools start to become more mature and have the ability to actually share and move electrons around, that then makes it a lot more uh, supportive uh, as well to drive growth across uh, region across regional growth and taking a regional view rather than an entire continent's view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're coming close to the end of our session. I just wanted to give, and I think we've we've been through the the, the biggest of the questions. Uh, I just wanted to give the the panel members an opportunity for any closing remarks you might have today on on today's topic. Daniel. I think for me, I'm going to try and keep extremely short. The, the reality is for the next uh, six months, probably early into the first quarter, I'd just like to emphasize to our clients, those on the call and those really invested in the continent, that at least from a financial markets perspective, things will likely still be jittery. Um, we, we haven't really found stable grounding. And that means some of the weaknesses that we have attributed to, to higher interest rate costs as a result of high inflation means that our economies will likely still struggle. It's we're, we're not done with a lot of the challenges we're facing today. And that also means our currencies will likely remain quite weak. Tara made the comment regarding the debt crisis that we're dealing with in several markets. We saw Ghana request an IMF program, Kenya's in the middle of one, Zambia just called board approval and the list goes on. There is fiscal strain on the continent. And so I would want to say as part in comments, we will unfortunately need to continue tightening our belts and really hang it in there. There's no other way of saying it from an economic point of view, given that these challenges are still prevalent and there's still bread and butter issues that we're dealing with literally. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Andy, what about you? Yeah, I think I think it's fair to say, Stephanie, that sanctions are going to be with us for a while. You know, even if Russia were to say tomorrow, we're very sorry, we're leaving and we'll pay for all the damage we did, which seems relatively unlikely. Um, sanctions are going to stay in place until there's been, you know, a complete making whole, if you like. And so in that context, we're going to see a continued constraint on the the supplies coming out of that region, a continued constraint on the logistics, 
And for me, if 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 I, if I had some smart money, I would be investing it in um, in in kind of ramping up the logistics for intra-Africa trade. There is already a plan to introduce a cabotage regime, which means a sort of coastal shipping regime within South Africa. And there's also a, a wider African maritime charter, which anticipates a, a sort of whole African cabotage regime. To me, that's where the future lies, because I do think that there will be enhanced intra-African trade, particularly with the um, African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And, um, and, and I, I think there's, there's, you know, there's room to be optimistic. Great, thanks, Andy. Uh, Patrick, anything further from you on the energy side? Nothing more the other than I believe this is now the time, as I mentioned when I opened, I really do believe that and anything that uh, myself or Agile can do to help that become a reality, um, we're certainly uh, engaging and, and ready to be engaged. Super, thank you, Patrick. Uh, and Tara, uh, I think it's fitting that you can, uh, you can have a final closing remark. <laughs> close, <laughs> close this. If I couldn't open, at least let us yes. close. <laughs> So, um, but well, I think we are in for into this disruption for the long term, uh, for for a while, um, and I, you know, and everything, and we are now in potentially a very volatile world at the moment. Um, we are moving towards what I call a well. We're going back to a bipolar world, which will affect trade. It'll affect business. It'll affect where you can actually source capital. Um, and uh, the closeness of Russia and China prevent, you know, presents a massive uh, risk to global stability, it has to be said. Um, and but uh, uh, particularly Africa and China have got an enormous, um, enormous closeness. But we're but the debt crisis that we're seeing from a geopolitical point of view, the people who sort out the debt debt problems are the IMF, which is still dominated by the US. So the US is a is remains a big power player. US, U, EU will, you know, their policies will be much more dominant and have much greater importance for Africa than what happens in troubled China and in Vladimir Putin's Russia, which is uh, which is in its end game or if if all the reports that we have are by now this is uh, europe has united unbelievably and uh, although it's a very volatile situation we are seeing a concerted united effort against russia for the first time and let's not be rosy cheeked or rose rose tinted glasses about what russia is uh, it is a mafia state and actually uh, this is the west's uh, chance to actually clean up its failure uh, to, you know, the West won the Cold War, but failed to win the peace. And this, to me, I asked the question at the beginning of my talk, is this the death throes of the USSR? And I think, yes, it is. Thank you, Tara. And thank you to everybody who's contributed today. It's been really interesting. And thank you for your openness. Claire, over to you. Thanks very much, Stephanie, and thanks to everyone in the audience who joined us for the very first episode of Talking Up Africa. This platform is driven by you, so please let us know what topics you want to see us cover in the future. We might even need a part two of the Russian-Ukraine war and its impact in Africa. I can see this conversation could have kept going. Thank you so much to our industry leaders and speakers and ASBN members for taking part in this very first episode. And I wish everyone a great day further. Please stay in touch with us here at Africa Scotland Business Network. I've put the, the website, our Twitter, Instagram, and here we're even on TikTok now in the chat. <laughs> stay connected with us and we will see and hear from you soon. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Claire. Bye. Bye-bye.